and to the Jews in a something called a covenant, uh, which is basically a contract between two groups or two individual people, two parties, uh, to a standard of relationship. And instead of kind of them being back and forth and all over the place, they're here on each other. And we talk a lot in the church about the covenant of marriage, um, which is actually a really good representation of what the covenant between God and his people looks like. And now we've got the covenant between us and, and him, you know, us, uh, looks like. Um, it's a defined type of relationship. So for the Jews, God has essentially written a constitution of sorts for a new nation where their God will be their king. And they will be his people in his alone. Right? So the Jews have that relationship laid out. It's clear for them. But they still sit. They're imperfect, right? Um, and they need something to help them atone or pay for their sin. In the same way that if you speed, you pay a speeding ticket. Some of you know a little bit more about that than others. <laughs> um, if you sin, you have a payment to pay. Right? Which Romans 6.23 says is death. Right? That we're deserving of death. Listen to me. So what does God do? We're going to open up to the verses 4, uh, 27 through 31, if I can get there. And uh, we're going to read what happens. And so, yeah, this is kind of a short text, but it's kind of wordy and angular, so forgive me if I stumble over it. Um, so it reads like this. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt, uh, where the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has committed. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. And the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, altar of burnt offering, and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove, as the fat is removed from the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. This is the important part. Get this here. And the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. Right. So, God gives the Jews a way out. If you read the rest of the book of it reads very similar to this. It's a bunch of different instances of like, if so and so sins in this way, sacrifice this animal in this method, and they will be atoned for and forgiven. Right? Uh, God gives the Jews some very specific rules for how to be forgiven of their sin. All they have to do is follow the laws of purity and sacrifice to the T, and their sin is atoned for. Now, this is a radical, completely new kind of grace, even as extreme as it sounds, in a day where everyone else was just guessing they had incurred the wrath of the gods. Are. <clears throat> so, I think there are a couple of things from this passage. First point is this that God takes our sin very seriously. Right? God takes our sin very, very seriously. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Sin is worth killing something over. That kind of sin is. So sin sets us in wrong relationship with God. It puts us in opposition of who God is. In the same way, the breaking of earth law puts us in, at odds with the governments and powers of the world. Right? In the same way that killing someone on this earth incurs the wrath of earthly powers, killing someone on this earth incur incurs the wrath of heavenly powers. Right? There's a consequence on that level. Right? I think we need to understand this. The sin that we walk in today, and this is really easy for us to miss, is just as serious as the sin that the Israelites were walking in and necessitated the law in the first place. Bowing the golden calf, right? walking in sexual immorality, they seem extreme. Right? They seem like these far off, like, man, I would never do this. Man, the lying, the pride, pornography, anger, drunkenness, all these different things, ultimately we're falling into the same sins with a different name. Right? That's the place that we're in right now. And so in the same way, we need a way out just like the Israelites did. That brokenness in your life, you can't fix that. Not on your own. Right? The standard of perfection that you're called to live to, you're never going to reach it on your own. There's a catch. God never intended for us to be able to keep the law perfectly. Right? That's our second point. The law's perfect intention was never to be an exact list of rules on how to get into heaven. It was designed to show the Jews, the people of God, that God was good and that they are not. In the same way that he shows us daily that God is good and I am not. Right? That I fail in that constantly. I'm open to Galatians 3, 23-25. It says this, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law. 
imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian in Christ until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So that word guardian in 324 and elsewhere in the passage, uh, that word in Greek is, it's actually said pedagogos. Can you say pedagogos with me? Pedagogos, pedagogos right? So pedagogos uh, actually means something like, kind of like a, a parental guardian, but it means in this context as a tutor. Someone who teaches you something, right? Someone who, like, kind of like boarding school, that it's oftentimes people in this world would send their children off to go learn from this guardian who would take care of them. Often it would be a relative, sometimes it would not to be a patron, someone who's more significant than the people who they, they were sending their child to. And so, uh, all this says, right, that this means uh, that while the law instructs us on what is good, it isn't a binding legality for us as believers. Right? It just shows us the truth of who God is. God provides a new and better way forward in the person of Jesus. Right? God provides a new and better way forward person of Jesus. Our familial connection with God is obstructed when we sin. Every sin we commit, even sin we commit that we're not aware of, merits guilt, has consequences, and has to be washed away. It has to be an unhindered relationship with God. However, we have a new and better way to reconciliation with the person of Jesus. Jesus is a new and better version of what the old covenant gave us, what it had to offer it is a fulfillment of the truth of God within the it. If the law doesn't do it for us as believers, the question, of course, begs, how are we saved? Romans 323 says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 623, like we said a couple of times now, for all have sinned, should not fall sin. For the wages of sin is death. That's the first part of that verse. But the cool part about that verse is there's a second part there that says, the grace of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 2,000 years ago, to fulfill the truth of what we read today, in the entirety of the law and prophets, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, steps out of heaven and made his dwelling among men. Not in the way that people expected him to, as a warrior king who was going to overthrow the Roman oppressors of his day, but as a baby, lying in a manger uh, in a town called Bethlehem. Well, that child was deeply special. <laughs> because that child was not just a child. While he was a complete human, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. He was fully man and fully God. He defies our understanding. Right? That perfect child would grow up to be a man that people would call Jesus. His name actually pronounced Yeshua in the Aramaic that they were speaking the day means Yahweh or God is salvation. Salvation has come to the Jews once again. Naming him salvation. This Jesus lives a perfect life, tempted exactly as we were, if not worse, but stood firm and never once sinned. The devil comes to him in the desert after 40 days of fasting and says, take, take these stones and make them bread. And he says, no. He says, look at all the kingdom ahead of you. And he says, it can all be yours if you bow to me. He says, no. He says, throw yourself on top of this temple. Because if you're the Lord, surely the angels would get you. He says, don't put your God to the test. He speaks his identity in that. <clears throat> this Jesus lives a perfect life. And at the age of 30, he calls 12 men to follow him. Begins a ministry of miracles and teaching like none the world had ever seen. Like none the world has seen since. When he spoke, the crowds wondered. When he spoke, the demons fled. When he spoke, the darkness trembled. When he spoke, the lame walked, the sick were healed, the blind could see, and three different people stepped out of a grave. That's the kind of God that we see in the person of Jesus. The religious and political leaders of the day saw this, and rather than rejoicing, the lie of about it, that their Messiah had come, they, feel, they feared for their standing. They fled, and they had him arrested. <coughs> they took him, and they nailed him to a tree. So God, seeing a perfect sacrifice which they laid out for him, pours out his wrath on the perfect son, killing him. 
perfect sacrifice to whom the lambs that we talked about earlier in Leviticus could never compare. And the God man dies after hanging for six hours on a tree. The Son of God who had come to save the world had been killed. But this is the crazy part that this was his intention from the very beginning. And that this was God's heart for his people to be brought back into right relationship with him through the perfect person of Jesus Christ. The Son of God came to save the world and to die on our behalf, but the story doesn't end there. For two days, the world is rendered dark and gray. But on the third morning, the sun rises and a color no one could quite explain illuminates the world. And a joy creeps on the sea. But the flash of light, the stone in front of Jesus' tomb, lent out by secret followers of his, is rolled away. And the angelic hosts stand in awe as they look down on the ground and they see God and raising up Jesus, now a resurrected living hope, defeating death and sin. And he walks out of the tomb, unstained. And what's crazy is that when he died, the veil that separates us from God, the line between us, that inequality between man and God, is broken apart. The veil is torn into and the heavens are opened. And now God sits in his heavenly realm at this place in front of us. As close as we could feel his breath, we were physically there. But that's the nearness that we're given now. That's the power of the gospel here. Right? The same power that rose Jesus from death to life is now at work in those who invite it in and believe. The sin that we're stuck in, we don't have the power to fix it. The hopelessness you feel, the anxiety, the things we've been talking about for weeks and weeks in this youth ministry, you don't have the power of life and death. You cannot fix anything. Only Jesus. Only Galatians 5 1 says it's for freedom. Jesus Christ has set us free. Stand firm before we not submit again to your sin. Like we're offered freedom in the person. Freedom from the law and freedom from sin. Two polar opposites in the middle, in the perfect place where paradox seems to dwell, where it seems to not make any sense. Jesus stands in the middle and says, I'm here. Right? Romans 10 says, we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we will be what we will be. Maybe you have no clue who Jesus really is. Or maybe you've grown up in church and this is the first time you're really hearing this truth. Understanding the person of Jesus who has come individually for you, who died individually for your sin. All I know is that Jesus is standing before you in the heavens, stretching his arms out wider than they were on the cross, welcoming you in the family that you are adopted into by love. <coughs> the power of Jesus is made change. I'm going to take communion in the second year as a body and remember to have this truth that I kind of just shot at y'all. <laughs> but man, do not let this opportunity pass you by. I know a lot of y'all know Jesus, but I also know a lot of y'all think you know Jesus. I would encourage you to ask yourself the question, does the relationship that I have with Jesus change anything about my life? If it doesn't, I would really consider where you are. Love leaders at the table of communion in your own life with leaders, of course. And Derek and I uh, would love uh, to speak with you as well. And communion is back there, uh, so you know. And we'll just be the next few minutes for this next song or so. Uh, but do what you need to do. Uh, would you pray with me? Man, God, uh, you are so good to us. Uh, man, Father, I ask that any words that uh, were from me, I wish you were out in this time, God, that they would go in one ear and out the other. Uh, but man, God, would you just do uh, what only you can do in these we are sitting here crying out, Lord, for salvation. We know that we're broken. We know that we're sinful. We know that we're in need of a Savior. And God, I don't want this opportunity to pass this pizza. But I guess they know that they're loved and they're invited in. And they have an opportunity to They have a day with you, God, and all you're doing is waiting on them. So Jesus, would they take that opportunity? Father, would they dwell in you all? But of all, we thank you for the gospel that brings us life and hope in the future. We love you. We praise you. Amen. Amen. Amen.